Before I start the talk, I have a disclaimer to make. I really enjoy drinking Australia beer, and I occasionally play Candy Crush. So now you know the hidden motivation of the talk that I'm giving today, which is on the big data behind the brain. Let's look for a moment at the human brain at this precious organ that is behind our skulls with 100 billion of neurons, which is 15 times more than the entire human population. How can we measure it? How can we get data from the brain? Well, there are different kinds of techniques. So some are more aggressive. You have to sacrifice the subject. Hopefully you do this with animals. Then you slice up the brain and then you do some sort of imaging. Or non-invasive techniques. Uh, where you have to have an access to a machinery, something like MRI or CT scanner. And if you look at all these techniques side by side, we will see that if we want to go to very um, fine details of axons or synapses, we have to go to these more aggressive techniques. But if you want to do in vivo imaging, then we are somewhere in the order of millimeters of spatial resolution. So we are sacrificing basically the spatial resolution. I myself are a fan of living subjects, subjects that you can scan and they will live after and you can scan over and over again. And that's my expertise, so today I'm going to talk more about these in vivo techniques and particularly more about um, MRI. The whole field of imaging is very recent. It happened in the last 45 years starting with the invention of X-ray and CT in 1979, it was the MRI, and only in the last 10 years, um, research has aris arisen with connectomics. And I will focus this talk more on how MRI works. So to quote one brilliant scientist, he said, you know, what these people do is really very clever. They put little spies into the molecules and send radio signals to them. And they have to radio back what they are seeing. And this is in a very, very simplistic way how MRI works. So here you see a conventional T1 modality. This is actually my brain. And you can see that these little spies are basically sending us information in each position in the brain where we are, if we are in the white matter or if we are in the gray matter. And another type of imaging modality is what, I call, what we call diffusion-weighted imaging that exploits the principle of diffusion in uh, tissues that contain water, and the brain contains a lot of water. So in the ventricles, for example, what you see on the left side, the diffusion is not restricted. But in the white matter where we have some organization, the diffusion is restricted. So something like putting straws in the glass of water. So if this little spice can tell us information about the probability density function, then we can reconstruct these beautiful three-dimensional maps of the brain. And this is very beneficial not only for neurosurgery, for planning surgeries, but also for all sorts of research in neurodegenerative psychiatric diseases. And you might ask, what happens with the function of the brain? How can we measure the functioning of the brain? Well, let's imagine that these little spies are telling us that when we are performing a task, say I'm tapping this finger, whether there is increase of the oxygen in the blood. And then they, these little spies send us this kind of time series, and if they are highly correlated, then we know that these two parts of the region are important for doing this kind of task. So now that we know these different imaging modalities, let's put the definition of the connectome. And it comes as an analogy from the word genome. The OM emphasized the notion of the brain as a large and complex system, a network made of structural and functional connections, edges, linking specific neural units, nodes. So now you remember all these techniques that I previously introduced. As you can see in the center, we have the, let me see how this works. In the center, we have the T1 image, which gives us the node of the data from the different brain regions. And then we can get the edges either from the tractography 
or from uh, this time series, from the correlation coefficient. And now we can construct the structural and the functional connectome. So imagine from this jelly-like structure that resides in our brain, now we have a representation of a connectivity matrix, this beautiful framework that we can analyze the brain with already existing graph theory. My brain, your brain, anybody's brain can be represented by this kind of complex ma matrix. Now this slide is going to be difficult. What happens with respect to data? Starting for a pixel, we are starting with bytes. A slice is in kilobytes. If we add some volume, we are already in about 100 megabytes. Couple of diffusion Im images, a half a gigabyte, tractography and uh, morphometry analysis, that makes the con connect on 1.5 gigabytes. Multiplied by 50 subjects for a study, or let's say 1,000 1, subjects if you have multiple studies in an imaging center, we are coming to about 100 terabytes. Is this the big data? I don't know, I let you decide. There are some open data initiatives that you can grab data, but to quote the director of McGill Institute, who is a very important guy in this field, they even have their own template, we are doing a really shitty job. It's not because we are not trying, it has to do with the complexity of the problem. And this is the motivation behind my work and behind the work of Mint Labs. We want to create something that this complex problem can give in the hands of the people who are not technically knowledgeable to program, to be able to use this complex data and to make sense out of the data, out of the brain. And this will only happen if the researchers don't stay with their data, if they release this data. I mean, by 2015, the, the data that has been released by one of the biggest journal, NeuroImage, is about 20 gigabytes per, um, per study. That's not much. But things are changing, and more and more we are going towards the direction of releasing the data such that many people can use it. And together with you, with all of you people that love data, that's why we are together, love the technology, love the brain, we're going to make a change of this field. And we are living in amazing time. I mean, nowadays you can 3D print your own brain-computer interface. There is a Kickstarter project, and you can create your own data. Or, for example, you can 3D print a brain. I'm holding the brain of uh, my co-founder for Mint Labs, which is really cool. If you are a brain geek, this is the best time to be alive in history. I want to thank my team. Uh, I want to thank everybody who contributed to make this amazing work. And I just want to say we are hiring. And also I want to invite all of you people who love the technology, who love neuroscience, who love big data, to come at our offices of every last Friday in the month. In the month. We are opening our offices. You will have plenty of ga gadgets and plenty of data to work. This is my contact information for any questions. Please feel free, free to contact me. and. You can also ask some questions now. Thank you.